All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all here. Um, I'm Dan Vermeer. I'm the director for the Center for Energy Development in the Global Environment, the EDGE Center, uh, here at the Business School. And um, I really appreciate seeing all of you here. Um, I think you uh, will be richly rewarded for staying for the last session in the afternoon on such a beautiful day. So really appreciate you being here. And I'm really thrilled to be able to uh, introduce you to Jerry Anderson. Uh, Jerry is the CEO of uh, DTE Energy and um, has had a, a really rich and interesting um, career at DTE, moving up through different positions uh, of leadership uh, and has been the CEO there for 20 years. Well, no, I've been, I've been there for 25, been CEO for eight and president, yeah. I think, for 15 or something like that. Right. Yeah. So, so Jerry, I thought we would start just getting a little sense of your background. I think it's interesting to see how people uh, get into the energy industry and how they move into positions of leadership. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, your career path and what led you to the en energy industry and what your experience has been uh, moving into positions of leadership. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, I um, really enjoy the opportunity to do something different. Uh, kind of been looking forward to this. Um, I got my first look at Duke University today. I've never been here before. Beautiful place. Um, I watched your basketball team last <laughs> night. I always enjoy seeing Kentucky get thumped, so that was good. <laughs> and, uh, You're already winning points with us. <laughs> yeah, well, a couple promising freshmen you have, too. Um, so I, uh, I'll just start with my, uh, my education. So I was kind of trained on the hard side. I was engineering and physics undergraduate at Notre Dame. Um, and I practiced engineering for a while. Eventually went back to school and uh, the degrees I ended up with were a master's in public policy uh, and an MBA. And I really thought I was headed for the, somewhere in the public sector. I was 20 something and wanted to take on uh, big problems in the world. Um, and, uh, and then out of the blue, got an a, uh, uh, invitation for an interview with McKinsey. Uh, the interesting thing was, I didn't even know who they were. Um, and my roommate told me you ought to take this. And long story short, I took a round of interviews and ended up with McKinsey. And uh, ended up there primarily working in two sectors, uh, financial institutions and energy. And I really liked the energy work. I found it uh, fascinating. Uh, and sort of a combination of you know, the, the engineering, the business, and the public policy. There's no sector more impacted by public policy than energy. So when I left McKinsey and was looking around, I, I looked at a lot of things, but ended up going to DT Energy 25 years ago. And I, I actually went to start up new companies. Um, it, I didn't take a job in the utilities. They were generating a lot of cash and didn't have anywhere to invest it. So I went in to start new businesses. And uh, you know, I tell people I arrived as a vice president of nothing. I mean, I had no people, <laughs> no assets, no nothing. And uh, but we went to work and it was, maybe simultaneously the most fun and most stressful phase of my career. People often say, this must be stressful for you. I say, it's nothing like betting your career on starting new businesses and then wondering about six months in whether any of it's going to work. And I had a new house and a new wife, and a, she was pregnant. And I was like wondering whether I'd just blown my career. So that gives you a real incentive to figure things out. <laughs> and we did. Uh, eventually, the businesses worked. and. They're about 30% of DTE now. So for those of you not familiar with DTE, so we're headquartered in uh, Michigan, provide a lot of the energy to the state. We, all, we operate in about 25 states nationwide in those other businesses. And uh, debt and equity total valuation of about 40 billion, equity valuation of about 21, 22. Um, so I'd, we're a sizable energy company, but as you know, the energy industry in the US is it's still got a lot of players, and I'd say we're one of the one of the larger players in this space. Excellent. So I first became aware of you and the work that you were doing. I uh, read an article in Utility Dive a couple of years ago, uh, which was about a meeting of, uh, of the Edison uh, Electric Institute. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and I think you are uh, head of the Environment uh, Committee yep, for yep. EEI. Mm -hmm. And I was really struck by the bold message that you had about the utilities 
uh, opportunity and responsibility to really step up and um, take ownership of the climate issue. Uh, you set some very bold goals uh, around that time frame. Tell us a little bit about the 80% carbon reduction goals that you set and what the logic was of why you sort of stepped out on that issue at a time that it wasn't an obvious thing to do in your industry. Yeah, that, the meeting you're talking about was in Boston in early 2017, which was just post the uh, Trump election. So it was a, an interesting time environmentally. So um, that decision has a little history. So I have chaired the uh, environment group for our industry for quite a few years. And in 2015 and 16, uh, my role was really centered on the clean power plan. Um, in 2015, the Obama administration served up the idea of the clean power plan. It was a big deal to our industry, um, bringing an industry that's got maybe 20 or 30 key players and 50 or more players to a common viewpoint around something like this is not easy. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time interfacing with the EPA and Gina McCarthy uh, and then the industry and, and my colleagues and peers. Um, it took a lot of evening phone calls and weekend meetings, uh, but we eventually got there. We got to the industry agreeing to essentially what was reflected in the clean power plan. Mm. And, um, you know, to get there, uh, if I was going to lead that discussion, I had to have the conviction that it was possible without blowing up the companies. And so we dove in at DTE Energy to financial and uh, engineering modeling of what it would take to pull off the clean power plan. And in the process, what I really learned is that um, the, what was in our heads from the last time carbon reduction had come up, which was around 2008, the Waxman-Markey mm -hmm. legislation, had all evolved in a big way. And, you know, we, after studying it, came to the conclusion there wasn't a sucker's choice anymore. It wasn't affordability, reliability, or environment. You could deeply decarbonize and do it affordably and do it reliably. And so I had the conviction to work with my peers that we ought to get after this because it's doable and we can, we, the technologies in low cost gas and, you know, rapidly declining cost renewables uh, make this possible. So uh, we took a, a hard look at that. I'd say the other thing we did with my team is, um, as uh, 2016 evolved and the election happened and, uh, the noise started about backtracking and coal was going to rise again and the environment was going to go in reverse. And I started to get a lot of questions. I pulled my team together and really asked, you know, what do we think our responsibility is here? Apart from the economics and the engineering, what's our responsibility on this issue in, in this milieu? And I think stacked hands on the notion that it was, we're in the middle of this, it's our responsibility. Uh, to address it and address to address it fundamentally. So in the wake of the Trump election and when it became quickly clear that the clean power plan was going to be shelved, which I felt bad about after spending two years trying to help put it together, uh, the questions just came in torrents about what was going to happen next. You remember we were talking about exiting the Paris Agreement, lots of articles in the press about um, backtracking environmentally. And so it was in that environment that we decided, let's take a look at a pledge, and why don't we take a look at what scientists are saying is necessary, which is 80% by 50, and see if we believe that's doable. So that's obviously beyond the clean power plan, and we, we modeled it hard and came to the conviction it was possible, and I think at a certain point decided, if we think it's possible, we ought to just show some leadership in this environment and, and step out and say it. But we were worried. Uh, because you remember we had a president who was tweeting about companies that um, he didn't like. And so we really wondered if we'd draw his fire by coming out so directly against his uh, agenda, which was very pro-coal at the time. So we spent a lot of time with politicians, the press, uh, opinion leaders, uh, preparing them for what we were going to say and why. And when we announced, which was early spring uh, of last year, uh, it couldn't have been more positively received, interestingly. We did not draw the president's ire. Um, 
politicians on both sides, Washington and in-state, were positive. The Republicans were positive because they said it just proves we don't need to regulate things to drive carbon down, and the, you know, the Democrats uh, predictably were for it. The press was uh, beyond expectations. We had some 200 articles nationwide, and I would say the dominant thread was positive. Um, opinion leaders were positive, customers were positive, and interestingly, a group we hadn't gone to ahead of time or investors, uh, the feedback was very positive as well because they felt like this is the direction things ultimately need to go and the fact that you're out in front of it is a good thing. So our experience after spending a lot of time worrying about positioning it uh, turned out to be overwhelmingly uh, positive. I'd say the other group that, that took notice was our peers, our peer companies and my peers in the industry. And I had a number of them approach me afterwards and say, you know, we, we saw what you did and uh, we're taking a look at something similar or we're not far behind. And we have seen that, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of similar announcements. Uh, so after feeling bad about the demise of the, the clean power plan, uh, as I've watched things play out since, I, I actually am not as worried, although I think a lot of the work that happened during that period is what allowed companies to move on to the next step, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and you're hinting at a lot of, I think, the stakeholder uh, issues that I think we want to dig into a little bit uh, later in the session. But uh, for now, I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more, if we can double click on how you see the path. You start as a company that depends pretty substantially on coal resources, and it's not a kind of a cold turkey process that you're going through to just switch to renewables or whatever. So how, how did you think about the kind of the sequence, the process of moving from where you are to achieve those ambitious goals by 2050? So two things have happened that are radically different from 2010, 2008. In 2008, Waxman Markey was positioned as a piece of legislation that there was a lot of serious attention to. And at the time, natural gas was $12 in MCF, and renewables are, were five times the cost of what they are today. And when companies looked at that, their conclusion was, if we need to do this, we're going to blow up our prices. And that was the time of the nuclear renaissance discussion. The only way people could see doing this was to build nuclear plants. And then the economic recession hit. That was when I became CEO, uh, right, in, right in the heart of that. And um, when the economic recession hit, um, shale gas also hit, and gas, people believe we were running out of natural gas in 2008. It's quite bizarre to think that a decade later we're awash in $3 natural gas. Well, natural gas is a 70% carbon reduction versus coal, so that's a resource that wasn't available, and of course, renewables have come down fundamentally. So in the early days of our deployment of wind, wind was somewhere um, in the 12 to 15 cent per kilowatt hour range, our latest project is 3.8 cents. Hmm. So it's radically different over that time period. Uh, and so uh, I think that, uh, I have to remember what question you asked me. I've gotten so deep into this, but it was, how are we going the about it? The sequence of right. the transition. Yeah, so those are what are available to us. But if you were to look at, well, hey, let's just go to cold, tur cold turkey and shut down the coal and replace it all with renewables, you blow prices up and mm -hmm. you blow reliability up. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's simply, if you do the engineering and the financial math, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you don't have to do anything esoteric to achieve a 80% carbon reduction. So the mix we have modeled, and I'm sure the mix will change over time as our options change, but is 20% nuclear, 40% renewable by energy, a lot more by, by capacity will be renewable, but their capacity factors are lower. So. 40% of our energy from renewables and 40% from natural gas. That gets you an 80 to 85% carbon reduction mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. And that'll play out somewhere in the 2040, maybe 2050 time frame. But I think all of this is going to come sooner than people think, not mm -hmm. later. And then I'm confident what will evolve is, you know, continued penetration of renewables that will probably pull the gas capacity factors down. So, mm -hmm. so the carbon reductions go from 80 to 90. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we figure out as we go uh, just how to configure the system to do it affordably and reliably. All the coal will be retired. Uh, we're taking that on that retirement in a way that allows us to backfill with multi-billion dollar renewable and gas investments mm -hmm. um, as the plants are shut down. 
So one of the things I think we need to realize is the one way to turn the public against this is to blow their prices up. Mm. And um, I mean, everybody's for it unless they have to pay very much. And then it quickly, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you know, the 80 percent for it shifts to a lower percentage as price starts to move on people. So I tell people we can do this aggressively. Uh, we can do it faster than we think. But we need to keep it affordable and reliable if we want it to be well accepted by society. Mm -hmm. The other thing I often say is this is about pace and depth, not about purity. Uh, so I was talking to Jim Robo at, at, uh, at the, I just came from Atlanta. There was a meeting of industry CEOs there. And so Jim is CEO of Next Era Energy. They're the largest deployer of renewables in the nation. And we were talking about this discussion on 100% renewables that's out there. Mm -hmm. And Jim was shaking his head saying, you know, we're at 8% today. And so we got a long way to go to get to 20 to 30 to 40 uh, before we worry too much about 100. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he's right. And I think that um, what a lot of us who are kind of close to the evolution would say is that we're going to have to go through some phases here. Uh, and as we go through those phases, carbon levels are going to come down fast. Uh, but it's not going to be a move to, I guess you'd say, purity day one. Mm. Good. So I wanted to dig in a little bit on the, um, the stakeholder kind of orbit that you're in. Uh, in, in particular, government. What role do you see government playing in facilitating, setting the, the, the speed of the transition? And, you know, is, is, is government leading? Is it following? Is it in the conversation with you on this? Talk a little bit about what kind of interaction you have. You're in a unique industry that has a especially, I think, um, you know, extensive interface with government. Heavily, uh, yeah, we, we got government at every level um, coming at us, federal, state, local. Um, so, look, there's still a lot of talk about uh, and worry about the clean power plan has been set aside and so the industry is going to go backwards. Here's the reality. The, the targets we set in the Clean Power Plan were a 21% reduction by 2021 in the industry and 32% by 2030. 2021, 21%. We're at 28% today, three years early. We'll be at the, I think we'll be at the 2030 number by 2021, mm -hmm. at the pace we're going. And most of us who are watching this play out believe we'll be somewhere in the 45 to 50 range by 2030. So we'll be well beyond what was ever anticipated. Mm -hmm. And so why is that happening? I think there's a couple of things here. One is companies are realizing it's doable. The, you know, things that get in your mind sometimes take a while to flip, but it's flipping for companies that the old a mantra that this is hard and, and expensive is flipping and, and, and people are, I think industry people are seeing that it's doable, affordable, and so forth. Now you can blow up the cross if you do it wrong, mm -hmm. but there are pathways that are very affordable. The second thing is that people in the industry, and I know I've been saying this overtly, is that the electric sector wins when decarbonization is the center of energy policy because the most straightforward way to decarbonize transportation and heavy industry and eventually commercial and residential is to electrify everything. And if you electrify everything, the electric industry ultimately is a winner. So we ought to be for that. And I think that fact has dawned on energy companies too, mm -hmm. that uh, what used to seem like an, an almost unsolvable equation in 2008 is now seen as it's a business opportunity. Mm -hmm. And when companies like mine begin to see something as a business opportunity, their pace is going to pick up, uh, independent of government regulation. They're mm -hmm. going to want to be for it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, and maybe we can talk about this later, the one way that companies tend to get back in a defensive position on this is when they're attacked and told, you know, uh, thou must or mm -hmm. thou are bad. Then they tend to get into old mindsets. And so I think. In this, one of the things I think we probably ought to talk about is in this world where companies are beginning to see it as a business opportunity, what's the role of 
uh, environmental NGOs and others. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think it's the, the, the same role that it used to be. So at the federal level, I'm not worried that the Clean Power Plan being set aside is going to slow things down. I think we're going to, I tell people all the time, we're going to run right by it by a wide margin. Um, at the state level, I think state governments continue to play an interesting role. So they continue to set renewable portfolio standards. They continue to have these integrated resource planning processes. Mm -hmm. And I think those can be a very healthy thing for, for example, the state of Michigan thinking about what resource mix should we build for the future. And we get in there and talk about uh, what we think will both uh, lead to affordable costs and lots of carbon coming out. And you reach consensus on that and, and we can move. So um, in some ways, there's more play at the state level today than, than federal. And for the foreseeable future, that's probably OK. So maybe you can talk just a, a moment about natural gas in the mix. That's obviously a big part of the kind of momentum that built toward decarbonization is moving away from coal to natural gas. Um, my, my perception is it depends a lot how you build that in terms of whether you sort of count on that for the long term or whether it is a bridge as some people talk, uh, talk about it. How are you approaching natural gas as part of the, part of the mix and part of the transition that you're going through? So, um, you know, we've, I said we've spent a lot of time modeling and studying this, and uh, I absolutely see natural gas as a really important bridge on both reliability and affordability. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're building a new natural gas plant today, about a billion dollar combined cycle plant. We're doing that as we retire three coal plants. And paired up with a billion dollar investment in natural gas is $2 billion of additional renewables. That's our backfill. We had a push to, hey, just cancel the gas and do it all with renewables. When we modeled what it would take, that was 30% of our peak production we're taking out. Mm. It's a huge portion of our reliability, dispatchable capacity. When we modeled what it would take in renewables and batteries to backfill, that it was untenable mm. economically, I can tell you that. And it, would not have been well received in terms of price impact. Uh, so look, I think we're going to get to a very heavy mix of renewables over time. Uh, but working our way through the transition from dispatchable resources mm -hmm. to the ultimate future, uh, I think gas has a very important role to play. That gas plant, by the way, because of its capacity factor and the fact that it's so highly efficient, it's about a 70% reduction versus coal is by far the biggest carbon reduction move we've made, even though we put you know, four or five billion dollars into renewables, mm -hmm. this will remove as much carbon as all of that, and mm -hmm. maybe more. Mm -hmm. So it can, it can play an important role. I think the role will evolve a lot over time. So I think these assets will come in as heavy energy assets, displacing a lot of the coal. And as renewables continue to push their way in, I think they'll go to cycling assets mm -hmm. that are used to follow load as needed, mm -hmm. and over time will really become peaking assets mm -hmm. that, that are uh, displacing what would be an otherwise uh, pretty expensive full displacement by batteries. Right. So I want to go back on the stakeholder um, issue that we started on. You mentioned NGOs. With the IPCC report that came out recently, there's, uh, I think, renewed sense of urgency about the kind of limited time window we need to, yeah. to make the kind of transition you're talking about. So, so pacing is all important. And I'm guessing that some of the NGOs and activists that uh, interface with your business are pushing you to go faster, to reti retire the coal plants faster, to make a shift to 100% re renewables, wh whatever. I'm not quite sure what they're asking of you at this point. But what would your advice be for people who really are committed to try to accelerate this transition, to try to stay within the windows that science is sort of laying out for us? In the NGO community? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, the more I live with this, I, I feel the same, that pace is really important. And if we got to push pace. I agree mm -hmm. with that. I had a, uh, a really interesting conversation with the former governor of Colorado, uh, Ritter, do you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Former yeah, Governor Ritter. Really good guy. Um, very interested in renewable energy deployment. Doing a lot of his work these days in that space. And we got on this topic of NGOs and energy companies. You know, for a long time, energy companies have been sort of the favorite enemy of environmental NGOs. Uh, but 
uh, Governor Ritter was telling me about a conversation he was having with one of these organizations where he was telling the, the lead player, look, uh, you know, not every energy company you run into needs to be your punching bag. Uh, because a lot of these companies are in their own way trying to make the transition to the future. And they're powerful companies with big balance sheets. And when they begin to see this as an opportunity, Ritter was saying this, you ought to be finding ways to encourage them and make them successful, not hmm. you know, back into the punching mode with them. Uh, and I think he's right. Um, if you know, companies like ours believe that they can be economically successful and successful with their customer base at a faster pace, what that really means is investment opportunity, and it's a business opportunity. They'll go faster. They'll resist if they think they're being pushed into a position or attacked into a position that mm -hmm. threatens their viability. If they feel they need to go so fast that it'll blow up mm -hmm. their political or customer compact, they'll resist mm -hmm. almost instinctively. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw some of that in Arizona mm -hmm. last night where you know, a big RPS went down and what happened was the company came out and believed that it was gonna drive their costs too much and shut down their nuclear fleet. Mm -hmm. So they spent a lot of money uh, advertising against it. It got beat 70-30. And in the wake of it is a, a lot of customer perception of, well, it must be expensive to go to mm. high percentage renewables. Mm. That was not, that actually was the, mm. what Ritter was talking to me about. Mm. He was, this is not productive. I'm mm -hmm. working with the companies. They want to go. They just um, need to have some of their other uh, interests and investments protected. I think particularly in that case, the mm -hmm. nuclear, which mm -hmm. has a big role to play in low carbon production anyway. So I, I think that um, NGOs have been in a mode where they really felt they needed to punch organizations. And I think they need to reflect and ask, what is the fastest way to move things? And a lot of times that's gonna be by unleashing companies to get on with the future rather than attacking companies and putting them in a sort of reflexively defensive mode. Now, some companies, you know, may need to be attacked, mm -hmm. uh, and they may not want to get out of the future. They, whatever the case may be, mm -hmm. then I say there's probably a role for um, sort of the old-fashioned attack. But as companies evolve, the interaction with NGOs should evolve too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So another one of your stakeholders is your customers, and your customers probably look different and have different needs and different priorities than they did a decade ago. Tell us a little bit about how the expectations of your customers are changing and how that plays into your strategy. Obviously, decarbonization is a piece of your agenda, but serving your customers is your ultimate uh, driver. How are their needs changing? Well, uh, it's pretty consistent when you poll customers on anything that has to do with um, a progressive approach to energy uh, that you'll get 80% plus that want to move on to the future, want clean, want low carbon. Uh, and, and so the customers support it. Now they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. They really don't know what it takes to get there, but they're for mm -hmm. it. Um, and so I don't think we have customers resisting us, although it is true that when the customer base comes under economic stress, like we did in 2000, you know, the, the Great Recession, that sentiment sort of evaporates in favor of you know whatever makes my budget work. Um, and so my conclusion is that there is great public support for this as long as we manage it in a way that's quiet for mm -hmm. customers. Quiet means quiet on rates. That we, if you start moving rates at five, six, seven percent a year, uh, that's a way to build a lot of customer resistance. Mm -hmm. If you move it at a two, three percent a year, which is doable, uh, they're not really gonna notice. Mm -hmm. um, another way to have it not be quiet is to have it be unreliable in some way, mm -hmm. so you really need to manage that, that well. So customers are for it um, as long as you can manage it in a way that doesn't make them against it, mm -hmm. is, is an easy way to say it. Uh, investors are for it too, as long as you manage it in a way that's good for your business. Mm -hmm. Once they begin to believe that you know, this has become negative for you, it's, uh, they'll be all over you to stop it. So mm -hmm. we're trying to walk the balance. You know, I'll sometimes, uh, in, this, in this urge of faster, um, and you sometimes get folks who will say, you know, 
we got to go fast enough that price is almost irrelevant. And I say two things to them. I say, look, um, as a CEO, I, I'm as likely to have you in here today as I do low-income advocates for citizens in Detroit who are desperate. Mm -hmm. So I really can't move their rates at 10% a year. Mm -hmm. It just won't work. And I said, secondly, if you want to go fast, the fastest way to stop going fast is to move rates fast mm -hmm. because it will destroy public sentiment. The good news is you don't have to do that. We have enough tools at our disposal that we can make fast progress mm -hmm. uh, in a short window uh, and keep, keep it affordable. So I, I said DTE, 50% uh, reduction by 2030, very doable. Um, you know, it, it may turn out to be deeper, faster than that as technology continues to evolve. And I think the country will get to 80 to, 80 to 90 uh, faster than we anticipate today. Mm -hmm. Good. So you talked a little bit about the kind of the electrification, including of the transportation sector. You're in uh, Michigan right, yeah. with some of the big players in that sector. What are you hearing from your peers in that industry in terms of the the future that they're they're building uh, building toward? So uh, yeah, I, our headquarters in Detroit. So I talk a lot to the um, to the auto CEOs and to advisors like McKinsey, you know, McKinsey folks uh, work a lot with them. So I talked to my ex-colleagues there about their perceptions on electric vehicles. Um, the story's pretty consistent. So to me, it feels a lot like renewables did a decade ago when um, everybody knew that renewables were gonna be a big part of the future, uh, but the costs were still challenging. Um, and so you fast forward a decade and that's all you know, violently changed. Mm -hmm. um, today, if the reason that the manufacturers in the United States where there aren't mandates and credits that help their economics, um, the reason they resist is that if you understand the margins on an electric vehicle versus a traditional vehicle, they're almost non-existent mm -hmm. due to the cost of batteries and consumer predilection. And so they don't want that to become a big part of their sales right now because they know it'll, it'll uh, hurt their viability and not, these are companies that have been in bankruptcy or on the brink recently, so they want to stay healthy. Um, so what do I think will happen? What, what do I hear? Um, first of all, I hear they all know it's the future. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. It'll happen first in China. China's going to drive it for environmental reasons. And they'll do it through mandates. They'll do it through incentives. They're doing it through licensing preferences. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to license fast, electric. Mm -hmm. You want to license slow, uh, internal combustion. Mm -hmm. Get to the back of the line. So China uh, um, will drive it. Low-end vehicles is what's perceived. So they won't be premium vehicles. They'll be low-end. And... Um, uh, sort of base case 30% of sales by 2030, although there are scenarios where people could see 50 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in China by 2030, mm -hmm. depending on how hard they push it. Europe will, will pace similarly, but pretty differently. So again, driven by mandates. Mm -hmm. and you see those emerging in cities and countries, uh, but perceived to be coming in from the high end of the market. Uh, so these are going to be kind of luxury buyers or people who can afford... Uh, to pay the extra that might need to be paid for electric vehicles today. And then the U.S., a lot depends on the discussions underway right now on uh, these uh, fuel economy standards. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the auto companies are in the middle of those because there's a lot at stake. But if the fuel economy standards are slowed down, probably in the range of 15% by 2030, um, GM made an interesting move the other day. It was sort of panned by the industry, but GM came out and said, give us a mandate of 25% by 2030 nationwide, mm -hmm. but put in place the supports necessary to keep us healthy as we go through that evolution. It's not a bad idea. It's kind of what happened in energy, where people knew renewables were expensive. So they started in and ramped as they became more affordable, and there was pretty healthy tax credits to to help them enter the market. And so uh, whether the federal government ultimately does something like that or not, uh, we'll wait to see. But uh, the US depends a lot on the, f on the mix of EPA policy and whether legislation ever, 
ever comes in. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, nobody that I talk to senior in the automotive industry doubts that electricity is the future. That's mm -hmm. why they've all got 20 or 30 models waiting mm -hmm. uh, for, for volume to pull them. So I want to go back on uh, renewables. As they scale, as they, be, they become more integrated into the grid, we see more of them. It triggers some reaction, too, um, in terms of people's uh, not wanting them in their backyards, perhaps. It may also raise issues in terms of what we do with the waste of uh, these renewables long term. Do you see any sort of uh, liabilities of renewables that will become more important for you to manage as, as you see more renewables as part of your mix? Well, I'd, I'd say this. We're getting um, heavy pushback on wind deployment in Michigan. Um, so the most productive wind area in Michigan is shut down now. Mm. Uh, just as we were getting to the really juicy new technologies and the best wind domain, mm. we're done. Uh, and that's customer sentiment saying we just don't want our viewscape affected by these wind turbines. So we're moving to almost purely agricultural areas where the farmers see it more as another crop and are less sensitive. But in a state like Michigan, those are limited. There are enough small towns and people who move out to the country to hobby farm and really aren't in it for the money and don't want the view impact. And I, I think I was mentioning earlier that I, I saw this emerge in Germany just about as we were getting started. Uh, they were getting pushed offshore uh, back when we really got started investing around 2010. And I remember telling the head of our environmental organization, we're going to get shut down with wind. And he argued with me that it, it wouldn't happen, but we are. The other thing that I have wondered is whether solar will avoid that. Um, and I was mentioning, I was at this, this meeting of industry CEOs and was talking to a CEO of one of the large companies who said he's getting pushed back on solar. Mm -hmm. And it's solar on farmland and solar in areas that have viewscape too. So you think, I can't see it from miles away, but when you drive through the countryside and see fields and fields and fields of panels, people begin to say, hmm, you know, do I want this? So I, I always say people want energy badly. They just don't want it to be produced. And, <laughs> you know, usually when things scale up, they, they don't like it. So wind was cool when there were three of them against the sunset. When there's 300 against the sunset, they say, this really sucks. You know, stop. And I don't know whether that'll happen with solar, but uh, Tom Farrell of Dominion was was mentioning, you know, we're building a 1,500 megawatt gas plant. So really, you know, kind of state of the art. And he said, that's 100 acres. To produce the equivalent amount of energy with solar would be 60 square miles. Mm -hmm. So he was like, okay, that's kind of five miles by 12 miles of panels. When you start doing that, are people gonna start saying, stop, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. My, my initial thought had been, yeah, we got a lot of land in this country. We ought to be able to find the land to deploy the panels. But it's just that uh, we're going to have to find places where people aren't sensitive mm -hmm. because it doesn't take very many loud voices to turn it really messy. Mm -hmm. That's what's happened with wind. So, mm -hmm. look, I think we're going to deploy a lot of solar in Michigan. We're going to, you know, at, when wind runs out of gas from pu public sentiment, we're going to solar, and we'll do a lot of it. But I do wonder at some point whether mm -hmm. we're going we're gonna to run into dynamics even there. Uh, and for years I thought, probably not. You can't really see it, but we might. So you're also in the natural gas business. Uh, and uh, in our prep call, you mentioned the idea of renewable natural gas. And so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you mean by renewable natural gas and what's the state of the art and how you see it playing in your business. So it's very early, uh, but we like getting into things early. Uh, so this, for us, this is sort of a startup uh, business. But when you know when you say renewables, um, your mind is electric. It goes to wind and solar. And when you think natural gas, uh, you really there really is no meaningful renewables. But we're pushing into the space. And from a business perspective, so those are your business students. It's a uh, Margins are a lot better than what we see in solar and wind. S margins in solar and wind have gotten vanishingly small. It's so competitive. And there's very little ability to differentiate yourself. You're a technology taker uh, at large volume. 
Uh, they aren't complicated to run. Uh, so you say, well, what's the skill? Citing and financing. And there's only so much margin that goes with citing and financing. Renewable natural gas is a different game. It's at this point new, a little messy. People can really screw it up if they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. We've been in landfill gas production for 25 years. Um, we're getting into agricultural waste production of gas. Uh, it's being pulled into the transportation sector. So people are looking for ways to decarbonize transportation. So they're looking at natural gas vehicles, usually fleets. Uh, but now they want the fleets to internalize renewable gas. Uh, California is a good example where um, we're taking, we've, we've gathered a bunch of dairies in Wisconsin and are producing the gas and shipping it to California for their bus fleet market. Uh, but it's methane, so it gets a 25x multiplier. So um, it, it reduces carbon at a very high rate, so we can afford to do what we're doing. Actually, we're doing very well with those mm -hmm. projects. Similarly with landfill, we're shipping landfill uh, as methanol to Europe. We're shipping landfill to mm -hmm. California. We're shipping landfill to other niche markets that want to introduce renewable gas. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting space. I'm going to a big investor meeting at EEI in San Francisco this week, and uh, we're going to be talking a lot about renewable gas as an important business initiative uh, for us that we think is going to help us grow on the edge. Uh, and it's a fun business because it's so early. So we're in early, figuring it out, uh, figuring out the markets, and, and we'll grow them. I, the real question for natural gas is how much can you scale it? And that really depends on, on whether there are resources, bioresources, that can be pulled in sustainably over time to play that role. And we'll see. I can see that sparkle in your eye from your first job of starting yeah. new businesses and the I, uh, utility. Yeah, this, I, this is the stuff that, uh, that gets really, you excited. I really do. Yeah. I, I like growing things. I like growing new businesses. And this will be a fun one. So we have a lot of other rocks we could turn over here, but uh, maybe I'll just conclude with a, a question. What's your advice for students going into this industry? It's changing fast. Um, there's big turnover in, uh, in the workforce in this industry. Um, what's your advice for how students can really be movers and shakers in being part of this transition? Well, first of all, I'd say it's a, it is a really fun industry right now. Um, it is changing fast and it is fundamentally for the better. Uh, we're becoming a much greener, uh, yeah, we're just becoming a lot better for the environment. And it's happening quickly, um, but there are a lot of challenges to work through getting there. They're fun challenges, but you know, everybody talks about wanting to uh, find purpose in their work, find something bigger than themselves that they can believe in when they get up. That is not hard to find in energy these days. Mm -hmm. um, so it makes, it's made it very satisfying for me. You know, when I was back in those public policy days, I wanted to find something important to throw myself at, uh, some big issue that uh, was good for the world. Um, your paths in life are often circuitous, but I feel like I've landed there. I feel like I've landed at, at uh, a really important thing to work on, um, and I'm in a position to be able to do it. People who enter the industry today are, are in that position because so much of what we do is headed in, in this direction. But to work on it, you've got to develop competencies that really contribute. So uh, you can't go in with um, just desires to do good. You've got to find, you know, if you're going into solar, you probably have to be good at siting or financing mm -hmm. or, you know, operations and maintenance or something that really contributes to the effort. Uh, and so I'd say, uh, you know, as you enter the field, it's a great field to enter, but you kind of got to pick your skills and go deep. The other thing I say is you get into a company like ours and just look for rope. Uh, you know, if we, you see the rope, grab it, pull. And if you keep doing that as a skilled person, um, you'll move through to, to find some really interesting places to contribute fast, if you're in the right company at least. So great, I think you've helped to connect a lot of the dots of the kinds of discussions we've had over the course of the whole day. I'd really like to thank you for being here and for sharing your thoughts. All right, thank you.